if you're already confident with drawing organic compounds in either expanded or condensed or skeletal structures, then it's now logical that you move forward to studying functional groups. We define a functional group as a set of atoms and bonds that dictates an organic compound's properties and reactivity. And if you think about it, in the big picture, any branch of chemistry studies some kind of matter's properties and reactivity. So if you want to really study organic chemistry, then you have to know how organic compounds behave as well as react, which is dependent on this thing. It's like saying that if you are not good at identifying functional groups, then it will be very difficult for you to study anything or figure out anything about whatever organic compound you're looking at. And I've seen a lot of students before where they know supposedly the concept, but just because they don't know how to identify the thing in front of them, everything goes haywire. And we want to avoid that by getting familiar with these groups as early as now. By the way, those organic compounds that have the same functional group are said to belong to the same class. And let us now see the common functional groups in introductory organic chemistry. So we will be identifying the functional group for each as well as identify the name of the class. So first, let us go here and imagine that we have carbons bonded to each other, which, by the way, are not complete drawings here because if you know, this carbon, for example, should have four bonds and these are hydrogens, but we are keeping those hydrogens invisible because they don't impact the name of the class of organic compound. So again, just assume that the hydrogens, if they're not written, are just out there. But let's say I have nothing but carbons and carbons and carbons single bonded. We can call such class of organic compounds as alkanes. I can call this organic compound an alkane. But the moment that I see a double bond, then we can call this organic compound an alkene. If it now becomes a triple bond, then we can call this organic compound an alkyne. And again, as early as now, I want to clarify that the name of the functional group and the name of the class are not the same thing. The name of the functional group here is the double bond. It doesn't have any fancy name, but the name of the class having those double bonds is an alkene. There is a difference. Anyway, since these three have nothing other than carbons and the hydrogens, which I just said are invisible, so their general name, hydrogen and carbon, is hydrocarbon. We call these three hydrocarbons. Now, fun fact. Back then, alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes had very drastically different names. And at one point, chemists have agreed to give a more uniform name to them, which now resulted in the uniform prefix alk. For this reason, you may now encounter the letter R for many cases in organic chemistry. And we label that R as an alkyl group, with reference to the fact that it could be any of these three, and since all of them have alk, then it's an alkyl group. We're just saying that it's now an alkyl group. We use the YL to denote that this thing right here, whether it's an alkyne, alkyl, or alkyne, is attached to any larger thing, so it's just a portion of that entire thing. So for example, if I have here my alkyl group, and it's attached to the OH to get us this entire thing, that entire thing is now called an alcohol. But we have to respect that from here, there may be specific names of the functional uh, group itself without the alkyl chain or the alkyl portion. In this case, we do have such a uh, name. So if it's just the OH, you do not include R, then we can call this specifically hydroxyl, which in this case is very logical because hydro means the hydrogen and oxy means the oxygen here. Sometimes though, people are very loose with how to name this. So some people still call this an alcohol despite not having the alcohol group. But I think at this point, the most important thing is that we can agree that these two words are pretty much applied to the same type of compound.
So what if this time, instead of OH, we have the functional group OR? Well, first, the name of the entire thing R, O, R, is an ether. But if you are going to name the OR portion, then we can say alkoxy. Because it makes sense that alk for alkyl and oxy for oxygen. However, in the big picture, some people would view this as, not as an R with a separate OR, but something like an oxygen that is sandwiched by two carbons. Anyway, regardless of the, your perspective, whether you saw it as the first or the second thing, it doesn't change the fact that it's an ROR and you should identify it as an ether okay, or an ether no matter what. Now, let's have an SH group. And RSH compounds are called thiols. And the SH is called the sulfhydryl group, which makes sense again because we have sulfur and hydrogen. If you notice, the all is kind of a nod to the all of alcohol, as if we're saying that thiols are like the sulfur additions of or sulfur analogs of alcohols. That's why we use the prefix thio because thio means sulfur. So in a way, if you make it a long cut, you can say thio alcohol, but chemists kind of agreed that for some reason, they can even shorten that to thiol, which is, I think, also convenient for us because it's less letters. If there is the sulfur version of an alcohol, then you can think of RSR as the sulfur version of an ether. In this case, we use the complete word. It's just thio. It's just thio ether. Or the sulfur version of an ether. And as far as the SR component, you can also call this an alkyl thio. And when I said when I said also, it's something like alkoxy, but you just retain the alkyl at the start just like here, but replace the oxygen with thio. Okay? But again, just like earlier, you may also view an al uh, a thio ether as a sulfur sandwiched by two uh, carbons instead of another chain having the alkyl thio group. It doesn't matter. The perspective should not prevent you from still giving us the same answer every time. But now what if I have a nitrogen as my functional group? The name of the class of organic compounds is amine. And the nitrogen itself has a very slightly different word uh, or spelling to it, amino. So we're just saying that it's just the last letter. I can say that compounds containing the amino group are called amines. You may also notice that this time, I did not highlight or even put a color to the hydrogen here. What does that mean? These hydrogens are not crucial to the name amino. So even if, for example, one of these hydrogens was replaced by another alkyl group or set of carbons, we still call this an amine. And even if this last hydrogen was to be replaced, we will still call this thing amine. There are many cases that students, especially beginners, don't already know what the name of the compound is, thinking that maybe if this one is replaced by a carbon, it would have now a different name, I bet no. So the minimum requirement is the nitrogen, and every single time, it's an amine. Except for this case later, where we have a CO attached to it. But now, we go first below and see Rx. Assuming that we know that X is a halogen, we can call this an alkyl halide. Alkyl halide because it's basically an alkyl group that is attached to a halogen. Sometimes also you may notice that an alkyl halide is termed as a haloalkane, which is not really that far off. Because you just put the halo part at the start instead of at the end. Actually, when we practice naming organic compounds, you will figure out that this one is more obedient to the technical formalities or the technical um, instructions on how to uh, write halogens. They're always written at the start. But for now, it doesn't really matter because we're just trying to familiarize the appearances of these classes. So far, all of my groups here 
used a functional group that has a single bond. So all these classes used just a single bond. But now let us go to this column because you will see that across the board, you will see double bonds, right? As you can see. So I think out of respect for that thing, we must give it its name. The C double bond O is called a carbonyl group. And we can condense that as CO. So what if my CO is sandwiched between two carbons or two alkyl groups? We call this thing a ketone. And to say that they are sandwiched every single time, it cannot be uh, denied that we say they are required to be internal. What if I now have C double bond OH? Now, this one is going to be called an aldehyde. And instead of just looking at the carbonyl group, you can now imagine this as having that hydrogen as part of its uh, complete group. And we can call the C double bond OH as formula. If you abbreviate this, you write this as CHO which is something, again, kind of different that chemists agreed upon because if you ask me, if I read this from left to right, I would have kind of written here as this one as COH, right? But instead of writing that as COH, and I think some books or material do, this is the more traditional way of writing it down. Now, the fact that it has hydrogen means that it's at the end of the chain, right? You won't see a hydrogen if it's not at the end. So, it's like saying that this time, aldehydes are required to be terminal. And in fact, they're just pretty much the same thing. It's just the location which is different. And I said that ketones must always be internal because guess what happens if you put it at the end? It becomes an aldehyde. Conversely, guess what happens if you place the carbonyl of an aldehyde internally? It now becomes a ketone. And since they're basically the same thing, it's just the positioning which is different, I can call these two guys as carbonyl compounds. Because it's just a matter of playing around with the location or the position of their carbonyl group. But now, if we have the CO attached to the OH, it's a different thing altogether. You're now not just looking at one functional group just like earlier, it's like you are merging two separate entities. By the way, this one is called the carboxyl group. Or if you condense that, it's COOH, which makes total sense because we just learned a while ago that CO is carbonyl, right? CO is carbonyl, so it's carbonyl. And earlier, OH is hydroxyl. So if I combine both carbonyl and hydroxyl, so the carboxyl word has some logic in it. And since these things have carboxyl groups, we call RCOOH as a carboxylic acid. Okay. And now, I want to show you these four classes of compounds below it. You will notice that we're just replacing this OH here with different things. But across the board, you may see that the RCO part from the carboxylic acid is kept or is intact. That's why we have, we, we have to learn that sometimes that RC double bond O portion is called an acyl group. Something like it is an acid, it was the fragment or the segment of the acid earlier, but YL, just like a alkyl earlier, telling us that this thing is now part of something larger. So what if this time my acyl group is attached to an OR? I can now call this an ester. How about if I have my acyl group attached to a nitrogen? I can call this an amide. And notice, I again did not highlight the hydrogen because I can replace this with uh, carbons and we will still be calling it an amide as long as I have the CON. Now, what if my acyl has a halogen? This is easy. Guess what? The name of this thing is simply an acyl okay, halide. 
because what is it? It's just an acyl with a halogen. And speaking of acyl, you can even view this long thing right here. Sometimes I call it the twin towers because of these two tall carbonyl groups. But I can think of them as two acyl groups. So that's like the two towers attached by an oxygen. And we can call this an acid anhydride. Although sometimes I even just drop the word acid because there's no other anhydride that we uh, study in introductory organic chemistry classes. And therefore, since we can assume that these four guys just inherited the acyl group of carboxylic acids, they must be fundamentally related to this, right? That's why a common name applied to esters, amides, acyl halides, and acid anhydrides are, or is, carboxylic acid derivatives. And we should see the relationship of these things at one point. Now, as I zoom out, just for you to see the complete picture, I need to warn beginners of this. There are obviously words and even structures that look alike, and your challenge as a student is to not interchange these things. So for example, Ether and ester, quite sound similar, right? And they both have the OR, but it is your responsibility to remember that the ester is the one with the carbonyl group. The same applies with amines and amides. This is even scarier because the only difference is a single letter. So remember, if it's just a nitrogen, that's amine. But if your nitrogen is con or CON, that's an amide. Sometimes it's not necessarily the name of the class, but the symbol of the entire class. For example, and this is, I think, the number one issue I have with students, they always switch these two, ketones and esters. The name itself is unique, right? Their, their names are very different, but look at the symbol, RCOR and RCOOR. Just that oxygen can throw you off into uh, mistaking it as a, either of the two. So if you think there is an oxygen, but there isn't really one, it's a ketone. And you might answer ester wrongly. Or if there is an oxygen and you didn't notice it, you will call it a ketone when in fact it's an ester. I can go on and on with my experience with my students over the years. But at this point, I think you have to figure out for yourself which of them can potentially confuse you and find a way to not get confused. And really, it's practice from this moment on.